right, we're gonna go live and Great. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so very much for joining us um, tonight. I'm Cindy Chavez. I'm a member of the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors, and I'm running for mayor of San Jose. And I'm here with a very dear friend of mine, Jim Kaneen, former uh, Republican Assembly member, uh, former um, head of our Silicon Valley San Jose Chamber of Commerce, and been a leader in the business community really for all of your adult life. And one of the reasons I'm so excited to be here with Jim is that Jim and I um, have been friends for a very long time. And I would say that for those of you who are old enough, what it means to be a little bit country and a little bit rock and roll, um, that we have often been um, on different sides of issues, but always with one very big focus. And that is how we build relationships, uh, you know, really across the aisle. And Jim, um, when he served in the California Assembly, was really one of those people who could talk to Democrats or Republicans and get work done. And so I've always really, really admired him. And so I'm delighted to have you join us uh, tonight. And we're going to be talking a little bit about how we get business done in our community, um, both small business and what it's like to, from your perspective as a business leader in this community, yeah. to think about the future of San Jose. Well, thanks for having me. And I just want to say at the outset, uh, the way you set this up was spot on, right? You know, I deeply admire you as a leader and I always have, but I've also deeply disagreed with you at times. What? We've been on opposite sides of many campaigns in our community. Uh, but I think that there are moments, uh, inflection points in the life of any community as the story unfolds uh, that says at, at the right time, this time, here and now, we need a leader that can sort of melt away the old divisions um, and unite people to get things done. Because I think what's happened in our community in many respects is uh, a lot of finger pointing and blame. It's because we've always been in different camps. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've created a campaign here, I think, that is very unique. And I think it speaks to getting things done in business. I think it means advancing our community where you have brought people across the ideological spectrum to say, Cindy is the person we trust. Cindy is the person we want to lead our city. Uh, and that ranges from Carl Gardino, uh, myself, Michael Mulcahy, Michael Van Avery, uh, um, these unusual folks that have been maybe on other sides of other kinds of campaigns um, who are saying you're the one that we trust to do it. And uh, you know, I think back to the first time that we really had a, a meaningful meeting. I knew who you were uh, when I was in the assembly, you were elected to the San Jose City Council. But uh, when I left the assembly uh, uh, and took uh, the reins of the San Jose Silicon Valley Chamber of Commerce back in 2001, we had a chance uh, for the first time to work together. And, and when I look back over those 20 plus years, um, I've seen um, that fundamentally one of the key things, and I think people can relate to this, is um, trust, a foundation of trust. It doesn't mean you always agree, but it means that you can take that person's word to the bank. Uh, and that means something. I think that's what's, uh, I think, uh, helped our relationship grow is this ability to trust each other even when we disagree. So I want to just share with all of you that um, when I first met Jim, I, one of the, I think one of the most important stories you ever told me was a little bit about after you won your election, um, who you made phone calls to the next day. And I was hoping you could share that. And the reason is that there's a, um, there's an opportunity here to really get people from very different ideologies to get a chance to work together. But there's a theme about how you do that. And I thought, Jim, um, you did some masterful work once you got elected. Oh, thank you. I, I uh, am actually, I think uh, the, I think Tom Campbell and I were the last two Republicans uh, for partisan office that represented districts uh, um, geographically in Santa Clara County. Uh, to win our elections. That was 1998, by the way. Mm -hmm. Now, there's been many Republicans for nonpartisan office that have held office over that time or uh, fringe parts of the uh, uh, outer parts of the county, but for a district in. And, you know, uh, I ran in a Democrat majority district in 1994 to win my seat in the state assembly. It was about 43 uh, uh, Dems, 36, 37 R. Um, 
And uh, I was a good fit for it because I was a fiscal conservative. Uh, I was stingy with other people's money, uh, uh, but I was uh, very independent on uh, on social issues. Uh, I happened to be a running against at the time, uh, the president of arguably the most powerful union in the state, the California Teachers Association. Uh, and it was a very, very difficult race. Uh, I came from Applied Materials, a high tech company, uh, had a lot of tech support. Um, the unions were coalescing around my opponent. Uh, um, and I won that election by about three and a half points that year. Uh, so I was running well ahead of Republican registration on my message. But um, the first day, uh, right after the election, the first phone call I made was to the president of the CTA uh, or the executive director of the CTA in Sacramento um, to offer uh, where we might see agreement. Uh, after all, I was the son of a public school teacher. Um, my mom was actually the union rep uh, at her Palo Alto Unified School District school, uh, elementary school. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, we don't always see eye to eye on issues either, but um, uh, I felt like the big fight was really about um, preserving a strong public education system. And I always felt that. Um, I just felt like we needed more competition. I wanted more reform in our public schools. Uh, but I picked up that phone and it changed the relationship uh, because then there was this, um, you got to give people permission to listen to you, right? Um, that's the key in public life. Uh, uh, if you start out harsh, you start out always in a battle, uh, people will stop. They'll stop listening to you. Mm -hmm. In this case, it gave them permission to listen to me and my ideas. So even though I supported charter schools uh, uh, and their expansion and lifting the cap, uh, uh, I was actually endorsed by the CTA in the next election, even though we had fundamental disagreements. Because always, I find in public life, sometimes the uh, um, few controversial issues aren't necessarily the 90% of the issues of actually mm -hmm. getting work done. Mm -hmm. And I served on the education committee and I think the teachers saw firsthand that I was there to solve problems, that I did support public education. I just wanted reforms. They respected me and they embraced uh, uh, my campaign that next time. So uh, thanks for allowing me to share the story, probably a long-winded attempt in uh, uh, recounting it, but I think it's important, uh, uh, the concept that um, I see in you uh, which is giving people permission to listen to someone else's ideas uh, because of the way you approach uh, uh, public policy. Yeah, and I, I'll just say that um, one of the, the challenges with, with grownups, you know, when we run for office and we're in office, if we're too focused on the fighting, um, we're really not supporting uh, the people that we're here to support. That's right. And so as an example, the one thing that um, I remember this very, very well at the, when you were at the chamber is that we really at the city were starting to focus even more on small businesses. And part of the reason for that is that we know that large businesses can hire really smart lawyers and can you know, hire somebody to represent them, but it's the small businesses that get kind of squished in our process. And so at that time we had worked together um, to really create an ambassador program, a red carpet program is what we called it. And it was intended to make sure that small businesses not only got to the front of the line, but got the attention that they needed and the support they needed from City Hall to get their tenant improvements, to understand what kind of permits they were going to need from other levels of government to get their business license. And I'm really interested in, in doing that again, because I, you know, I was just meeting with some businesses last night and um, and, I, and I heard something that I, I just thought, wow. So this business leader, a small business leader said, it's like, you know, I was so excited to open my business in San Jose because then I felt like I was wanted. But now it feels like San Jose is trying to squeeze out the little guys mm. and focus on the big guys. And I said, well, I, I don't I don't think anybody's doing that on purpose, but the fact that you feel that way right. means that we've made some huge errors. Right. And so one of the things I hope to do as mayor of San Jose is really to take some of those really good ideas that we had, refine them, update them, you know, in terms of technology and all of that, and really create a path um, for small businesses. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about your thinking about what we were maybe doing right or not right then, yeah. what we could be doing right now. No, I remember it well because... Um... Uh, the uh, what they called the dot bomb bust in the economy had really occurred early in uh, yeah. 2001. Uh, the stock market collapsed before two buildings in New York came down. Um, and so the work that the city was beginning to be done with you and others um, 
putting the spotlight on small business uh, was a baton I was willing to take up as Chamber of Commerce CEO at that time. And I remember also the creation of a small business uh, commission, uh, not a standing committee of the city council, but a commission. Um, and uh, our vice mayor, Chappie Jones, who's endorsing your campaign, uh, was a member of that commission at that time. Uh, and he would often uh, uh, talk about uh, the need uh, for certainty uh, in small businesses uh, uh, in the regulatory environment. And so when you're talking about uh, the speed at which uh, and the cost of which uh, a business license uh, can happen, uh, uh, where approvals can happen, uh, sometimes it's small things, right? You know, my wife, Jennifer, I married into a small business uh, family. Uh, they owned furniture stores. Uh, you may even remember it. It was the Oak and Brass Showcase on Bienza Boulevard. Uh, so it had a San Jose address, but it was really in Cupertino on the <laughs> west side of San Jose uh, um, near the Britannia Arms. And, uh, um, you know, one of the lessons that came out of that was understanding that um, small things that government does can have big impacts on a small business because the margins are so difficult. So when you talk to somebody at City Hall for a, uh, uh, a permit to put up a, a faux wall uh, in the middle of a, you know, that has obviously impacts on ingress, egress. I mean, I understand all of those safety concerns, but when you can't even get an answer from City Hall, mm -hmm. um, uh, that's, that's, uh, there's a cost of doing business. Uh, and you know intuitively ways that you need to display uh, your product so people will buy it in a retail environment. And when delays happen, um, there's consequences to that. And uh, uh, sometimes a small business isn't able to withstand um, delays. And so, you know, I love what you're talking about, Cindy, in the sense of uh, putting the spotlight back, right? So that commission, by the way, was disbanded, I think, in the early 2010s um, mm -hmm. in San Jose. Uh, and it was stopped. Uh, um, and then a lot of the small business issues got folded into a standing committee of the city council, but it doesn't say small business on it, right? Mm -hmm. It's just in there. Um, so I think that putting the spotlight back on small businesses and um, the current day, what's, what's in their way um, is going to be important because let's face it, uh, not only are small businesses responsible for most of the employment in our communities, uh, uh, but it's also the waves of immigration that come to our communities and immigrants who start businesses uh, that are responsible for so much of the bulk of the jobs in our communities in the small business world. And uh, uh, so I think there's a whole new set of issues um, that the city ought to be focused on uh, to make people that uh, have English as a second language, um, uh, have uh, financing issues uh, uh, where we can work better with uh, financial partners, uh, uh, to put capital in, um, uh, but also um, saying yes quicker uh, mm -hmm. is so much so important. And so, you know, if we can have something that says this is the small business committee again uh, and have um, uh, the city recognize, even though we're the 10th largest in the country, um, uh, it's still the scores of small businesses throughout uh, from the Almaden Valley to Alviso um, uh, that are uh, providing uh, the bulk of the jobs in our community, too. You know, I think you're absolutely right about the Small Business Commission. And I know the reason the city did that is that during um, the, the Great Recession uh, Depression, the city looked for every way to save money. And so one of the things they did was sort of combine all these different uh, boards and commissions. But I think the important thing that you raise, and I think it's worth us just kind of saying out loud and thinking about it for the future, is that when you think about um, economic development as being the, the bread and butter, and you think about planning, yeah. building, and code enforcement, getting people their permits, and getting people through the process, that that is the one area the, that you probably shouldn't cut back on because it's the area that you've got to be ready to spring into action as the economy shifts and being strategic about what you do to preserve and protect businesses um, you know, in the interim. So I think, I think that's a great idea. I would love to do that again, and I bet by doing just that, by putting that commission together, it would allow for a much more strategic, thoughtful approach yeah. to supporting small yeah. businesses. And the other big piece of it uh, that I think that you're gonna be very effective on is that um, people need to feel safe when they're walking down our streets uh, and they're uh, walking into small retail environments. Uh, uh, and so this emphasis on making sure that people have a clean, uh, and safe environment, uh, uh, whether that's in downtown or 
in Cambrian, um, where you have a great uh, small business champion that's endorsing you uh, that represents District 9 in Cambrian, Pam Foley. Uh, and uh, she has uh, high confidence in you in addressing small business issues. And of course, she's been an owner for decades and uh, will be a powerful voice for it. But having these, um, uh, this as we re-engage, I mean, it's a new world now coming out of uh, pandemic, everything else, uh, that people can feel like they're getting back to normal, but also overcome this uneasiness that we have out there. And so I think it's really telling um, that our police are supporting you, um, that people who have led big business associations uh, representing small businesses like the chamber or big businesses like the leadership group in Carl um, are, are putting our faith in you to address some of those kinds of issues as well. Um, and I know you feel powerfully about making sure we, we do clean up these streets and we do have uh, safe environments for us. So. That's absolutely right. And I'm, and I'm glad you touched on that because I, I will say that the other thing I think we can do better is that both Chappie um, Jones, and I'm sorry he's not feeling well, but we'll get him back with us um, in the future. So Chappie, I hope you're not watching. I hope you're asleep <laughs> um, and resting and taking care of yourself. And um, council member uh, Foley, I think that you know the other opportunity we have is taking people who have real experience that have extraordinary talent, putting them in leadership positions at the city. So you start to see, you know, that that voice really represented, and right. that's what I really look forward to with the with the new council. And I do have the support of um, all nine of the council members, and you know, who aren't running for mayor and. And I think what's great about that is we've got folks who are on the left um, of me and folks who are on the right of me um, who are supporting me. But I think the reason they're so engaged is people are really ready for a change. They are ready to get work done. Um, and we're also, you know, frankly, I think there's a lot of talent on the on the, in the city and on the council that we need to focus in on um, and, and let them do what they do, because I think it's a better opportunity right. for us to get work done. No, I think that's uh, exactly right. I think that even uh, the more conservative members of that city council, uh, which I would count as Deb Davis and Pam Foley, uh, uh, centrist um, uh, and, and fiscal conservatives like our vice mayor, Chappie Jones, uh, um, uh, David Cohen, who's been very impressive. There's a, a center here um, uh, that... Uh, all together are endorsing you. So you have the center, you have progressives. Uh, um, we need a mayor, frankly, that can lead the council. Um, businesses depend on certainty as much as we uh, are concerned about the cost of doing business and taxes. Um, certainty in a regulatory environment uh, is golden. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you're gonna be able to provide is that kind of leadership. And I think that's why this unique blend of uh, interests are all coalescing around your campaign right now. It's, it's fun to see because, um, you know, in all of the mayoral elections that I've been involved in uh, uh, and council elections, it has been this sort of business versus labor. Uh, and I've been squarely on the side of business in those uh, uh, for the last uh, quarter century. Uh, um, uh, and nobody is giving up any principles in saying that maybe there's another approach where we all work together. And I think that's what many of us are saying in working with you, because you said something very important just a moment ago, which is drawing out the talents in other people. That's what good leaders do. They find out what are your talents and draw it out. Mm -hmm. You know, I could see some of that dating back to the very first times we met uh, uh, when I was a chamber CEO. I think there was a lot, a lack of trust between the business community and you during that time. And I remember some of our early meetings and I was encouraging you to engage the chamber uh, and to hear our voice. Uh, um, and, you know, what built from that is trust. And in one of those earliest moments, I remember in 2003, uh, the chamber started a program called City Trip, where we would take the civic leadership of our community to another community and learn how they were responding to similar issues mm -hmm. that we were grappling with here. Uh, and one of them was we couldn't get enough housing in our downtown core, uh, which was a critical mix for the businesses down there to actually have people who live in our core. And so it was really uh, uh, wonderful to have you join us on that trip. Um, and one of the things I admire most in public life is courage. Um, I always consider it moments of truth in public life. Uh, that term was coined by uh, Jim Morgan, uh, the former mm -hmm. CEO of Applied Materials, uh, uh, these moment of truths that you hit as a leader, which require courage. 
Um, and I remember you came back from that trip and, and saw that there was a regulatory thicket as well that was impeding um, the igniting of housing and cranes coming downtown and building housing. And uh, uh, you made that motion on the city council to waive some of those requirements uh, uh, for a period of time uh, to spur uh, economic development in our downtown core. And it was very impressive. Uh, uh, but those are moments that I really admire in a public leader. And even though you and I continue to disagree on certain issues or were on other sides of campaigns throughout those years, uh, um, it was uh, something I observed in you was this uh, picking your moment sometimes to stand up to a powerful interest that maybe it backed your campaigns. Or uh, uh, for me, it was uh, powerful interest groups in Sacramento that might normally support a Republican, uh, but I wasn't with them on an issue, whether that was as a pro-choice person or supporting reasonable gun control. Um, but those moments of truth, I think, are important in a public leader. And I saw it in you in that moment all those years ago. Uh, when you were serving on the city council. Yeah, and I thought, you know, I'll, I'll just say, and I'll, I'll say this to all of you who are listening, that I think that, um, that there were a lot of people in our community, and I'm sure you feel this way too, Jim, that because we see it, that, you know, on the campaign trail, who really feel disconnected and they feel yeah. unheard by their government. They feel disconnected. Some of them have been working from home for now years. Yeah. Um, we have, you know, just a lot more, um, there's a lot more tension in the world. And I think also there's a lot more uncertainty on the global, on a global scale, you know, everything from how OPEC is going to impact gas prices to whether or not we're going to see or continue to see shortages in materials and goods as we're trying to build housing and reshore some products. And, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about, and I'd love to get your perspective on it, is this, that I think in San Jose, for at least since I got here, there's been sort of in my mind, a genuinely far, false dichotomy between being pro-business or pro-labor or pro-environment and you know and pro-development. And, and I think because it's it's easier for the press and I think for some political interests to kind of whip people up into thinking that way, it completely shades how um, it, it, it shades data and it shades how you identify a problem and it shades how you approach solving it, right? Because right. If you if everything is seen through a prism of I'm not for you versus the problem we, we identified and the reason I thought the city trip was so critical was you picked a city and we went to Vancouver where you said, okay, what is, they figured out how to do infill development and they are um, a thoughtful community and what can we learn from them? Okay. And when we came back, you had to make sure that you weren't emotionally attached to any one thing, except if we were looking at the outcome of being uh, being able to build up downtown and that meant there were all these winners there, right? right? It was the environment, it was public transit, it was um, investors, it was people who wanted to live downtown, it was well, businesses well, who already were downtown, it was the businesses who wanted to come downtown. Right. And that meant that you had to take all the other things that you, that, that, that may be clouding our, our vision. And so I'm wondering now all these years, I, to me, I look back and I think, wow, what a dangerous framework we set up. And I'm curious now, you know, what's your vision for how we sort of smash back that old framework? Because it's so old fashioned. It is so out of date. Anyway, what's your thoughts about that? Uh, you know, I think that um, the first loyalty of an elected official um, has to be to the concept of civil association right? Yeah. That um, what we need more of in public life, in my view, is electing people who um, use softer words and harder arguments. Yeah. Um, uh, I think right now we have the opposite, uh, where it's so much easier to be a populist. And I do see it on the left, and I do see it on the right. Um, and while not a single position of mine has changed, uh, I did leave the Republican Party uh, after the 2016 campaign, uh, but not a single position of mine has changed, right? You know, I still support Prop 13 or tough on crime or whatever it may be, or lower taxes. Um, but I feel like in a way, um, uh, there are too many po political leaders who get the spotlight by the media. Um, 
because uh, the populist messages are so much easier to glom onto. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we all say that we want more centrist, or let me not use that word because it's ideological. And I, I'm not sure that's really the key point here. I think that it's uh, um, electing people who will genuinely solve problems. Now, whether they have a more left um, view of the world or a more right view of the world, they're in government in a pluralistic democracy, uh, which we know uh, is incredibly diverse uh, and wanna solve problems. Uh, compromise does not mean compromising principles. Uh, it means understanding what our moms always told us, which is if everything's important, nothing's important. You have to set <laughs> priorities. If every public policy issue that comes to the San Jose City Council is a matter of principle, nothing's ever going to get done. And it's infuriating to me. So we need to elect a, um, people who show a discernment of selecting their principles very carefully. And no one should, and we should hold to those like a rock. Um, but understand that most of what we do in government, 90% um, of it is all in these gray areas here of actually trying to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, you know, I would like to see more people in public life, uh, um, yeah, use softer words and harder arguments. Um, I'm seeing the opposite right now and it's frustrating. So um, I think that the response to your campaign for a lot of us who have been involved in public life uh, for a period of time um, and have fought many battles in one camp or another camp uh, are saying, uh, let's try something different and coalescing behind your campaign because we trust that you're gonna listen to us. Um, I think that's really important. So, uh, you know, a long answer to your very short, brief question, which was uh, how do we, you know, what do we think about um, this overlay right now. Uh, to me, that's the heart of it. Um, it's the comportment of folks. It's uh, electing people who have as their first loyalty this adherence to the concept of civil association in such a diverse society. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we compete with, with other countries around the world that are far more homogenous than ours. Um, and that's our, our strength is that that we've been able to bring people from all over the world from different points of view different ethnicities different religions that's why we continue to be the innovative society mm -hmm. um, it's it's emphasizing those things that we have in common and, and the secret sauce the, the 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 real strengths that we have that i think are really important and i think you know one of the things that you've just raised and um and i'll i want to talk just a little bit about how this could also um, influence how we think about our uh, economic development strategies. You know, one thing that um, that I also think about, and I'm, I'm appreciating and kind of just thinking a little bit about the hard argument part of what you just said, because I do think that um, when we're not using data and when we don't question assumptions, we solve problems in a really um, inexact way. Yeah. We actually waste a lot of time and money. Yeah. And so one thing, uh, and I'll just say this, I, it's one of the reasons I love the idea of a commission. And it's also as we think about um, small businesses and we think about how we get small businesses to want to be in San Jose. So if they can choose Campbell, if they can choose Los Gatos, if they can choose all of these other places, what would make them come to San Jose? And part of what I want to be able to say is that if you're a small business, you're going to get royal treatment. Like if, if you are trying to invest in San Jose, it's our job to invest in you. And that means that, you know, we've got to look at how we improve permitting and speeding that up. I also think we have to take a very holistic look at all the fees that are getting charged, because I think right. one thing that happens, and this was my, this was one of the learnings I had from going on that trip to Vancouver. I don't know if you'll remember this, but one of the things that we were trying to figure out is what were the real barriers to getting people to build a mid-rise in downtown San Jose and, and how how could we create more certainty for those who are willing to invest when nobody else was? And, right. and so, you know, this was, a, this was our attempt at making sure we were creating the, as much of the foundation as we could. And that included, I think your point about making San Jose safer, making San Jose cleaner, all of that. But what we did at that time was we took a look at all the fees that people were being charged and all of those um, issues. And we did have to choose, we're going to, we're going to give up on this one for for x number of projects and then and or we're going to add for y number of projects but what i thought was really important is we did it collaboratively 
We did it with the neighborhoods. We did it with community leaders. We did it with the Chamber of Commerce. We did it with the developers that were going to be investing money and the investors. And I think that is what led to, you know, now what you see kind of coming out of the ground in downtown. My point there is that I think about the fact that we have all these business people who are making decisions about rent, mm -hmm. how much money they're going to put into tenant That's improvements, right. how long it's going to take them to get their permits. And I'm very interested. And still make money. And still make money and, and be able to do it with kind of the speed of, of time and light. Yeah. So my question is, um, given that you're wearing your old hat as a, a, as in the chamber and your new hat representing so many different businesses, are there cities that you would say, San Jose, you could learn from this city? Or are there places you say, you know what, our whole, you know, all of our, our planners and all the folks who are putting our yeah. rules together, we had to do a, one of those trips or a learning experience. We had to look at such and such place. Well, and as you know, we went to several cities, uh, mm -hmm. San Diego, uh, San Antonio. Uh, I came back with a, an idea that was quickly snuffed out that we should allow more commercial development along the Guadalupe uh, uh, to mimic sort of the river walk because uh, uh. it has <laughs> such a huge uh, uh, economic impact. And uh, uh, I still think it's a good idea. But um, uh, you know, let me comment first, though, on this uh, notion of, um, you know, what I hope that you would bring to City Hall uh, is a message uh, to um, the staff who uh, are public servants. Uh, um, uh, but sometimes I think that all of us, uh, include me, um, think about the transaction in the moment. So how much revenue are we going to make on a business license fee? Or how much money are we going to make on uh, uh, this permit fee? Um, instead of looking at a little bit more longer term of what are the community impacts of that business succeeding, uh, that business having a small payroll, um, that business uh, uh, producing sales tax to the city, um, uh, the professional service firm that may come in uh, that then uh, uh, spills out into the streets to visit our restaurants. Uh, um, that it's not just about what revenue may be generated for the city in the moment. Oh, we can't lose that revenue. And thinking about the revenue generated down the line. Mm -hmm. And so I would, I would at least like that to be in the back of the mind before we say, well, you know, to close this gap, we need to ratchet this up. Because I think sometimes you create a spiral down when you do that. Mm -hmm. um, so remembering that, you know, the ultimate community benefit is a business that succeeds enough to employ another um, that creates a job uh, and then has that ripple effect in the economy, but also to the government coffers. Um, so it's that kind of economic growth that I think that, you know, is really important to, uh, to, to bring to the table. And that as you give more visibility to the needs of small businesses, that that's one of the takeaways anyway. Well, and I would say the point that you're raising that I think is very thoughtful is doing a, a kind of a, for lack of a better word, a whole cost accounting or a whole cost analysis of, right. of what's invested from the public sector and then what's the rate of return. And, and for a long time, I've been very concerned that, and I think this is true on the business side too, which is that we, we need to be very um, thoughtful about what opportunities get created based on the whole investment and what opportunities um, get created by the, by the, um, well, frankly, by by thinking um, longer term, and I'll just give you an example. Yeah. So I, I, you know, when I served on the city council, six because I, I was there 16 years ago, we still had the redevelopment agency. And one thing that the city was still doing then was taking properties that we owned and selling them instead of doing long term leases for development on them. And when I came back to public life, I, I really thought differently about that, in part because I was looking at cities like Santa Clara and other cities that were doing made, uh, keeping land or uh, you know starting their own municipal electricity or whatever that was and how it had a rate of return for them over the long term. So the, when I came back um, to the Board of Supervisors, we had a, a discussion at BTA about all these um, pieces of property that BTA had that BTA was looking at selling. And what I asked them to do was an analysis of the implications of selling land versus doing long-term leases to the bottom line of BTA, since we were going to be in business long-term, could this be another funding stream for to stabilize BTA? So we now have 200 um, acres that are slowly being RFQ'd and RFQ'd for housing and jobs, and it has a rate of return actually for the, the business, I mean, I'm sorry, for the transportation hubs as well. 
And um, and what we now know from research is that people are more likely to take transit if their job is within walking distance of it, which, so anyway, there's all these, uh, yeah, so there's both the rate of return for VTA, right. it's much better public planning because we're, we're allowed therefore to intensify development. Right. Um, and that return to VTA is really a return to the public and it's giving us an opportunity to meet other goals for the city in, in the cities that we're in, including that a third of all the housing has to be affordable somewhere on the affordability continuum. Yeah, which is a huge number uh, to make these pencil. And some of those assumptions were made, uh, you know, pre-pandemic. Um, and uh, so, you know, we're all going to have to be somewhat flexible, probably uh, in emerging um, uh, projects to, because we want them to succeed and we want them to succeed with as much uh, affordable housing as possible but succeed none, nonetheless. Uh, uh, and I want to separate out. I know there's a lot of frustration uh, on the public's part around, um, you know, the strategies around how we get people to use public transit. What you're really talking about is how to drive that forward and to utilize the assets that VTA does own uh, in a way that can really be a game changer um, for driving that, uh, that ridership. Uh, so I think it's a really smart strategy. And, you know, I guess my advice too, is it's always a mix of, of owning some land, leasing some land. Um, and it sounds like that's the direction of VTA now. So I, I admire it. Um, uh, and particularly around these transit stations, uh, uh, I think developers are beginning to become much more interested in wanting to develop the density around these transit stations, which I think will give mm -hmm. hope to, you know, my daughter and my son and their ability to still live in this community in an affordable way. And I think that's a perfect um, subject to kind of end on is affordable housing, because I know for the business community and the small business community, there are limits to what they can pay. Right. And as they're making decisions or employers or employees are making decisions about what, whether or not they want to even work in San Jose right. or in this region, that's something that we're going to have to really double down on in terms of affordable housing. And, and, and by the way, I would say along the entire continuum of affordability, right, from extremely low to moderate um, income housing. So, um, you know, Jim, I would love to get your thoughts on, on as we think about the future, where do you place affordable housing for the small business community in the hierarchy of needs? I think for the small business community uh, and, and maybe even for, um, uh, many uh, in the younger generation, um, having the city focus on um, what's been termed as uh, middle income housing, uh, I think deserves more emphasis than it has. I think governments brought a lot of attention to the need and requirements for low and very low uh, affordable housing. And, um, you know, I think the city has done or the ca county and the, the community has done important things, right? You know, like, um, uh, the measure that you uh, architected that's actually producing results and building affordable housing. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's important for people to see results and, and certainly uh, that measure is producing it. Um, and we want it to go even faster. But this middle income where people have professional jobs, they may be uh, police, fire, teachers, uh, uh, they may be young professionals, uh, uh, but they're not making a huge amount of money yet. Um, uh, they're moving farther and farther away. Uh, and we need viable um, uh, housing within their income limits. They, they just get out of the, the low income. Uh, and so that sort of 80 to 120 um, uh, median income, I think is really important to address more aggressively than we have in the past. And there's some good programs uh, out there uh, to try to address that. And I think you're right. And, I, and I'll just add that I think one of the challenges is we have to figure out how to get those programs to scale. And we have to figure out how to make the the um, the affordability requirements fungible enough or easy enough that they're not so um, cemented that right. we that we just lose people by five thousand dollars. And so one of it's the a nice edge, right? It's frustrating. And so one of the opportunities I think is really going to be for us to work with the private sector in a much more rigorous way to create more funds so that or you know make more funds available for. Uh, down payments or subsidies for that kind of housing. And I right. think if we really focus on it, I think we can make a big enough difference that our kids won't have to go live anyplace else, yes. which I know is important to Jennifer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and to you as well. Thank you so much. I this was such a delight. Delighted, honored to support you. Anything I can do between now and election day, we need to get you elected. I appreciate you very, very much. Thank you. Miss you, Chappie. <laughs> <laughs> That's great.
Yeah, there's some, uh, if you 